Hello and welcome to Handout 2, where we're going to cover Ampere's Law and, Lo and the uh, Lorentz Equation. Those are the two topics. Um, this is the second handout of the Calculus supp Supplement to the second semester of Introductory Physics. Um, this is a supplement where, supplement where we cover uh, topics in the second semester of Introductory Physics that relate to calculus, namely um, Maxwell's equations, so the key, key equations of electromagnetism, as well as some equations of modern physics. So here, let's discuss Ampere's Law. So we have two objectives in our understanding, and that is to understand that Ampere's Law can be used to find the net magnetic field due to any distribution of currents. That is to say, if we have a, any orientation of current inside of some coil of wire, a rectangle of wire, or just a long straight wire, then the magnetic field around that, any orientation of current can be found using Ampere's Law. Now, in practicality, there are some limiting cases where we're going to use it. But we want to understand, and here's kind of a, just a, a relation here, that Ampere's Law is to magnetic field as Gauss's Law is to electric field. So these two laws are really counterpoints to each other. Gauss's law uses the idea of electric flux to understand what's happening inside, how much charge there is inside. Ampere's law uses the idea of magnetic field strength at a particular or, um, point or at a particular distance to find out how much current is within that magnetic field. All right, so they have really, really similar ideas. Just one is for current and the other is for stationary charge. Okay, so let's talk about today's topic, which involves current. And this, of course, is based on the idea of electromagnetism that says that anytime you have a moving charge, you get a magnetic field, not a stationary charge, which is why it didn't come up when we talked, discussed Gauss's law, because those were all stationary charges. Okay, so first of all, here is our, our key integral. Now, what's happening in this integral is we have a line integral. Now, we've seen a line integral once before when we discussed um, voltage because voltage is defined in an integral calculus manner using a line integral. But for, the, for that case, we actually didn't use the same notation. We just used a normal integral. And the line integral, really, the idea only showed up because we were integrating over line segments. And there we use dl. I'll talk about why it, we use dl there, and here we use ds. It's not an important um, difference. But what is an important difference is this extra notation, this little ring because that relates to the fact that we're taking a line integral around a closed loop. And notice then that this notation is the same notation that we used in Gauss's law for a surface integral, because that was around a closed surface. So in fact, this notation only refers to closed loops or closed surfaces. It doesn't refer to say just any old path that could still be a line integral, or for that matter, could still be a surface integral, but neither being a closed surface or closed loop. Okay, so interesting to note about the notation. What's happening inside the integral is a dot product between the magnetic field and a little segment of that line that, well, forms a closed loop, okay? So this is the segment element of the loop. Now really the idea of using S here is to invoke thinking about arc length because S is usually the letter that's used for arc length as a, a segment of a circle. And here, because really we're mostly going to be talking about our closed loop being a circle, you know, it could be other shapes like an elliptical or rectangle for that matter, but most of the time it's going to be a circle. And in doing so, that's why we use S instead of just L, right? Okay, so anyway, dot product between magnetic field strength and S. So essentially then, since it's a dot product, it's only going to be taking, it's all, as we integrate this scalar value over our line, this case of closed loop, as we integrate this scalar value, what does the scalar value represent? Well, it only represents the component of the magnetic field that is parallel to the loop, because that's the point. We're only looking at the magnetic field that is actually in that tangential direction. Okay, so that's the actual kind of Ampere's law in calculus form. But what is it equal to? Well, it's equal to the current enclosed times the permeability constant. So here we have our old permeability constant, 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meters per ampere. And then we've got our enclosed current. Okay, and that of course we measured in ampere. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. Just This is whatever field there is, is telling us there must be some current inside. And depending on the strength of the field, that tells us how much current there is. 
It's as simple as that. It gives us a numerical value of the enclosed current. Okay, now, I set it equal to one other expression, and really the only idea here is that the enclosed current sometimes is a function of the radius, okay? And since it's a function of the radius, we can't just take current as just one value. We have to take current density and then integrate that current density over, well, the entire wire. Now, this is really similar to, if you look at handout one, this is a really, really similar idea that we were doing for Gauss's law, where we had a charge density distribution and we were integrating that over area, okay, or volume. So the current density is simply amperes per square meter, okay, so it's, a, it's not a volumetric density but an area density because it wouldn't make sense to discuss a volumetric density of current because, because we're assuming that the current is unchanging in the direction it's flowing, right? So if the current's flowing into the page, there's no variation in the current there. The current would only be a function of the radius, okay? And we'll see examples of that. But then the area element, okay? Well, here's the thing, right? We won't, just like with, uh, with Gauss's law, we didn't integrate over the volume and just leave it as dV. We integrated over some volume defined as, in that case, surface areas of concentric shells. Well, here, since we're just doing an area integral with our current density, we're going to be integrating over concentric rings, okay? So we'll see that in practice if it doesn't make too much sense here, okay? So let's take a look at the first example. The first example doesn't really um, involve too much calculus, and if you're in my Physics 36 class, you've seen it before, but it's just a really important introduction to the what, what Ampere's Law is really used for. So it's a good place to start, okay? So let's look at the problem. So a portion of a long cylindrical coaxial cable is shown in the accompanying figure. A current I flows down the center conductor and this current is returned in the outer conductor. Determine the magnetic field in the regions for R less than R1, so that would be this region here, for R between R2 and R1, so that's anywhere in this, that region, okay? Then R3, or R between R3 and R2, so that's anywhere in this region, and then lastly, R greater than R3, so that's just anywhere out here, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and tackle this. So use Ampere's Law to relate B to I enclosed. So for R less than R1, our I enclosed over I is going to be equal to the area enclosed over the total area, because notice pi R squared would be our variable R, right, the R that can be any, any length that we want, as it gets bigger and bigger, we have a greater amount of enclosed area, but since we're only interested in going up to R1, our maximum area is just pi R1 squared. So these ratios must be equal to each other. Now they're only equal to each other. The only reason we actually don't have to do calculus here, unlike in the next example, is because our current is uniform. Okay, so we have, we have a uniform current that is not a function of the radius, okay? So you'll see what happens when it is a function of the radius. Okay, so in that case, we can go ahead and solve for I enclosed in terms of the total current I and the variable R and the constant R1. Okay, and then we're going to set that equal to, using Ampere's law, we know that that's just going to be equal to B times 2 pi R. Okay, so how do we know that? Well, this is a formula that you would be given in physics 36. And this comes right out of the fact that this line integral up here for a line or a loop that's exactly a circle just becomes b times 2 pi r. This just times b 2 pi r. And the reason it just becomes b times 2 pi r is because the field is unchanging. The field is uniform at a particular distance from the center of the, of the wire, and the loop is a well, when you integrate over it, that integrating over ds just gives you 2 pi r, the circumference of the loop, okay? So that's really going to be what this integral always becomes, is just b times 2 pi r. Again, you can see some real similarity here to Gauss's law. Refer back to handout one, okay? So that means that our final result is simply that. We're just going to replace i enclosed with this expression here, which um, is then going to introduce a r right, because we have an r squared over r, so we lose this r, but we're left with an r in the numerator, and then we have an r1 squared in the denominator. 
So we have here that the magnetic field strength is growing linearly with the variable r as we go from the center to the edge of the inner of the two coaxial cables, okay? Or just the inner of the coaxial cable. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay, in part b, we're asked for the magnetic field in this region, okay? Well, in that case, it's simply mu naught i over 2 pi r because the closed current is i because that is the total current in this, this section, and it's not varying. We're not going to get any more of the current by going further away. And in fact, as we go further away, we just get a, a weaker magnetic field. Okay? So that's, that would be, this is the expression that you would have for the magnetic field strength from a single current carrying wire. And again, comes from Ampere's law. Now, the issue here, though, is that if you go far, far enough away, if you go a distance R2 from the center, you hit another wire. Right? You hit that outer of the coaxial, the coaxial cable. So in that case, things start to change. Okay, so what's going on here? So this is the most complicated step in, in this solution. Is here, I enclosed, or the current enclosed, is equal to the current in minus the current out. Okay, so in that case, the current inside is the, this the value we got for point B. That's the total enclosed current. So that's just mu naught I well, um, divided by 2 pi R. But then, what's going on with the current out? Well, we know the expression is going to look like this. It's still going to have our mu naught 2 pi r, right? So I'm kind of skip, skipping that step, and I know it's going to be in there. The only tricky part here is that I enclosed. What is that going to look like? Well, it's going to look like this expression here. Now, I'm not going to go into great depth explaining it, but I will point out why, why it works, why it makes sense. And ultimately, you have to kind of like set, set up a function here and solve for it. But if we think about this, if we plug in, because remember, R, big R is the variable. If I plug in R2, so that's exactly at the point where we started to get into the outer wire, okay, the outer shell wire. If I plug in R equals R2, then my numerator would just become R2 squared minus R2 squared, which means my numerator becomes, well, zero. And in doing so, that means that that whole expression goes away, and my enclosed current is exactly that. But of course it should be, because I'm not actually inside this next wire yet. Okay? But as I go inside the wire, this value starts to become larger, which means the overall magnetic field starts to become smaller. Okay? Because as we go further and further into the outer shell wire, this opposing current starts to create a canceling magnetic field from the inner current. But with what strength, right? Well, look, down here, we've got R3 minus R2 squared. Because that's telling us the rate at which that current is having an effect. It's basically just telling us how much is enclosed. And so, you know, before, we, if you look at the expression, we just had R1 squared to the denominator. But here we have to have the difference because it's not a cylinder, it's a ring. So really, this, this, this expression here comes just straight out of it being a ring, okay? as really you could say the numerator does as well. And the final thing I want to point out is what, just a good check here, what if we plug in R equals R3? Because in that case, kind of giving away part C, we should have a current of zero, or a magnetic field strength of zero. Excuse me, I'm saying current, but it will have a magnetic field of zero because the two currents will create at that point exactly opposing magnetic fields and the overall net magnetic field should be zero. Well, if I plug in, <clears throat> excuse me, a r equals r3, then the expression I'm going to have here is going to be r3 squared minus r2 squared in the numerator, same thing in the denominator, which means this whole part just becomes 1, and then we have two identical terms that cancel each other out. All right? So it definitely meets the expectation, although the form is a little dense on first inspection. All right, so let's go ahead then and solve for the magnetic field. All I've done here is just algebraically simplify the expression, and then we got our nice little expression for the magnetic field. Okay, and that's in the region between R2 and R3. So then finally, um, I said part C, but finally in part D, this is just asking for the magnetic field outside of the coaxial cable. Well, in that case, it's gotta be zero. Okay, and it doesn't matter how far you go, any point outside the coaxial cable has a magnetic field of zero. And that's actually one of the real applications of coaxial cables. So they don't create magnetic fields that are going to interfere with any other surrounding electronics. Okay. All right. So now let's move on to an example where we're actually going to use some calculus. 
All right, so in example two, we have a ring again. So it almost, almost looks like we're starting with a coaxial cable, but there's no center cylinder. It's just the ring, okay? But one thing's new here, and that is that our expression, our current inside of our you know, cylindrical, or sorry, our ring um, wire here, is a function of the radius, okay? So this is not a uniform current. All right, so how do we go about this? How do we start it? So ultimately, I wanna call some, first some attention to Ampere's law, okay? Because you know, that's what we're using, and then I'll read over the problem in a second. But first, let's just write Ampere's law. So I'm gonna have my closed loop line integral, b dot, fro dot product with ds, and then that's gonna equal, right? And then it's gonna equal mu naught times j d a. Okay, so that's that's definitely the starting equation. It's all everything we're gonna do is gonna come from that equation. Now, I, I just can't help comparing this Gauss's law because the comparisons are just so so apt. But the first thing that to talk about then is that this this side, right, the line integral, the thing that seems so complicated, since we chose such a nice shape here, it just a ring, is simply gonna become b times two pi r. Okay, that's so Absolutely one and done, okay? Because the entire magnetic field, because you know it's a it's a wire after all, it's not and I think the, the key idea here is about the, the direction because we're the wire, you know, we have it going right into the page, and that means that the magnetic field is going to be a ring. So when we make our loop a ring, they exactly lie on top of each other. So our chosen am Amperian loop, right? Kind of like Gauss Gaussian surface, right? Our chosen Amperian loop directly overlays on the magnetic field. So they like, so taking the dot product is trivial. Okay, at least it's easy, you know? And so then going on to this other integral, what's going on there though, right? Cause that won't be so easy. Well, we've got our mu naught, and then we're told the form of our, well, our current density, okay? So we're told that it's C R squared. So we can actually put that in the integral so C is a constant that we're told, we're given its, its value and its units right there. Okay, so three times 10 to the six amps per meter to the fourth, and those are the, the dimensions that make it work, okay? And then we'll have R squared, that's the variable, and then DA. So one kind of important thing to think about is, what does it mean to have CR squared? What does it mean to have that, that type of current distribution? Well, it's basically telling us that we have a bunch of current going into the board. Let's get a color that shows up well. So you know, I have I going into the page, or you know, in, yeah, into the page, we'll say, into the screen. And there's a certain amount of it here, right? This is kind of the, the density of current. But then as we get closer to the surface, as R gets larger, it becomes much more densely packed, right? So the, the packing of the current is increasing as R grows, right? So it's kind of loosely packed on the inner, the inner ring, and then it becomes much more densely packed up here, okay? So that's, that's really the idea of our current density, is it's getting denser with growing R. And actually, that makes a lot of sense because you think about the premise of a conductor. When you have a conductor without any current, so the charge is at rest, all the charge is gonna be on the surface because that's the only place where the charge could reside where all of those like charges that are repelled from each other can be a maximum distance from each other. Well, current's a bit different. Once things are flowing, that, that premise isn't actually true anymore. But you still should expect the place where all the flowing electrons are able to flow in you know, less packed proximity with each other to be where most of the flowing electrons are located. So it does make sense to have a non-uniform current density. It's actually a very, very real thing to consider. Okay, but what about the DA? You know, how, do we, how do we tackle that? Well, DA represents those concentric rings, okay? So DA are concentric ring elements. So what they would look like then is we'd have some little infinitesimally thin section of ring, okay? So the thickness here would be our dr, okay? And that is, you know, that's our infinitesimal part. 
And so that, that means that this, that entire ring has the area DA. So all we have to do is express that ring in terms of the, you know, how we would express the area of a ring, okay? And then we can integrate over R, which is great because our current density is a function of R after all. And so, you know, this, just to be clear that these rings, you know, it's not because we're using rings to find a ring, but you'll see that in the limits. They would, you know, they would show up as being just, you know, overlays on that. So maybe I'll draw it like this. All right. So these would be the rings that we're integrating over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's draw another one. All right. There we go. Mm -hmm. Trying to get it just right. There we go. Close enough. Okay. So this this would be this would be our dr. Okay. I just wanted to put in the picture as well. So that would be our dr. Okay. All right. So then let's go ahead and solve that integral. We'll at least change our differential. So I'm just gonna write it down here. So C R squared, and I'll, I'll address the limits of integration in this step as well. But let me just do that that substitution. So what what is it going to be? Well, it's going to be two two um, pi r times dr because it's just it's just the circumference times that tiny that tiny thickness. So two pi r times dr, right? That's the area of an infinitesimally thin ring. Okay, and then the limits. Well, that's the thing. If we, if this was a solid cylinder, like the homework, then you would, we would just go from zero to R, but we can't go from zero to R because there's no, there's no current in that empty space in the middle. So our limits of integration have to go from A to R. Simple as that. Okay. So then let's go ahead and continue with actually solving this with the rules of any derivatives. All right. So then we'd have, we can pull a two pi out and the C as well. And still have our same limits, a to um, b, and the way I wrote r, sorry about that. That should be a b, and so should this one. All right, there we go. We're not going from a to r, our variables are, but the constant, the outer radius is called b. And then this would simply be, oh, I left lost my square there. That should be r cubed dr. All right, everything's looking good. So I have space, so I'll go ahead and just go down the next line. So then I'd still have my two, we'll do mu naught pi c. And then when I, when I evaluate my limits, I'd have a r to the fourth evaluated at b minus an r to the fourth evaluated at a, and then all over one, one of the fourth. So I'd have b to the fourth minus a to the fourth all over four, okay? There we go. Let me fix this. All right, and it looks like we're gonna have some little cancellation here with this becoming a two down there, okay? So there we have it. So then our final expression is at least for the um, the enclosed current is mu naught pi c b to the fourth minus a to the fourth over two. All right, so then we just want to actually solve for the magnetic field. So then going back to Ampere's law, we have that b equals two pi or b times two pi r equals the equals mu naught times the enclosed current, which we now already have nicely expressed. So then I'll just write mu naught pi c b to the fourth minus a to the fourth all over two. All right, let's see what we can cancel out. So we can definitely cancel out a pi. We can uh, multiply um, or divide each side by a two and then that's going to get um, 
you know, our expression to be in terms of, um, oh, oh, I saw what I, oh, I just realized something I did. So, because I'm looking for, what is the magnetic field at a radius of three centimeters? Yeah, so actually I'm not finding it at B because I, I, was, I was solving it for um, the magnetic field at B, and, but I'm not, I want, I want to evaluate only up to R equals three. So I have to change my upper limit again. Apparently I'm cursed on my upper limit. I'm just gonna write this as R, um, we'll call it, mm, let's make it, because I want to make it clear that it's not the variable because it's, it's, a, it's a particular R. Um, so let's call this R1 and R1 and then R1. And I'll put that in the figure as well so it's clear what R1 is. And then R1, okay? And then again, R1, okay? And the idea is that R1, to be consistent here, R1 is equal to three centimeters. Now B is equal to four centimeters. So that means what R1, how R1 would show up in the, the figure is it would look like this. So R1 would kind of be coming out right to there. Not quite that far. There. All right. There we go. Line that one up. All right, and then we'll call that one R1. Okay, so now that all makes sense. And so that means that if I'm interested in the magnetic field at that point, that point also must be R1, because that's, that's where I'm finding magnetic field strength after all. And so to be clear, this is R1, because again, that's, that's the distance at which I'm measuring the field. Therefore, it has to be the same radius. Okay, so then, what I would do is I want, I'm ultimately trying to solve for the, mag, for the magnetic field, solve for it as a, its exact strength. So when I do that, I'm going to have B equals, and then I have um, my R to the fourth and so on. Let's see. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, looks good. All right, and then... One thing that I want to make sure is that I take care of my signs correctly. Because I've got the I've got the circle, I've got the magnetic field strength, um, and everything enclosed correctly. And R1 minus H to the fourth, that all looks good. Okay. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have to we have to get the sign the sign right. It actually has a. Um, um, do we care? We do we care about what point? Yeah, like kind of what direction it points. Um, not too much, because if I'm thinking about the magnetic field strength. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not going to worry too much, too much kind of about the the direction of of the current. Um, I'm really interested in the magnitude here, because um, you know we have the magnitude of the current density and I, um, what is the magnetic field. So really, I am interested in, in the the magnitude of the magnetic field. Um, as far as the directionality, we could we could um, kind of clarify that with a simple right hand rule, um, since we're told that the um, the current is coming out of the page we know that the magnetic field must be turning um, in the uh, counterclockwise direction because um, we have a current, carries a current out of the page, yeah. And so if we were to have our thumb face out of the page, if you hold your right hand on, on the, the page of the screen or in front of the screen, have your thumb facing towards you and then curl, curl your fingers, you see that your fingers curl in the counterclockwise direction and that's, that is the direction of the magnetic field. Right, that's the that's the direction it must be flowing. Okay. All right. All right. Looks good. Okay. So let's then go ahead and continue with the magnitude. I'm um, sorry for getting delayed there. So then we'd have our mu naught times c r one to the fourth minus a to the fourth all over 
R1 times 4, or 4R1. All right. That looks great. Okay, so now we can go ahead and plug in our values. Okay, so let's do that. All right, so we have got some space to write here. Yeah, I can fit it in. So I got 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla amps per our tesla meters per amp and then multiplied by our distances here so we've got um, distance one and distance two so oh let's get our constant so our constant was three times ten to the negative six and that was amps per meters to the fourth and actually i'm probably not going to be able to squeeze it in so let's bring it down to the next line there we go and then times r1 of the fourth so that is our three centimeters that was all in centimeters correct yep all right so i'll just write it like this then so 0 0.03 meters and that's all that's raised to the fourth power and then minus that inner radius which is just two centimeters so 0 0.02 meters also raised to the fourth power okay and then we'll divide that whole thing by 4 times r1, which is just going to be r3 to the 4th power again. All right? All right, well, not to the 4th power this time, but it's just going to be 3 centimeters. So 0 0.03 meters. Okay? All right, everything looks good. So that's our final field strength, and that gives us 2 times 10 to the negative 5 teslas. All right. And that is our answer. So 2... Um, review the overall approach here. We did a integral in over in order to find our um, our line integral, but that ended up being of very little consequence and was mostly conceptual. We did a more computational integral to find our current distribution, and in that in that case, we had to pay attention to our limits of integration and our differential substitution, just taking dA and changing it into concentric rings. That allowed, that allowed us to integrate over dr, since our current density was a function of r. After that, it was just a matter of solving the integral and doing some algebra to clean things up, right, to get our final answer. For your homework problem, you're going to have a, sol a solid uh, cylindrical wire instead of a ring-shaped cylindrical wire. You're going to have a new current density in this case, it's, um, it's given as a ratio, and it's r to the cubed, but same sort of idea. There's going to be more, more current as you get um, closer, closer to the surface. It's going to be growing. Um, and then you're uh, given some values and then asked for the magnetic field at three points. So you have to you know, do, it, do it a couple times, but overall the approach should be very, very similar. So that's it. And